All right, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Cash Daddies, okay? Uh, you know who I am. I'm Sam Tripoli, and uh, joining me uh, is a uh, 607 local, okay? And uh, one of my favorite people to talk to, we talk to uh, nightly during the week about what's going on. Please welcome my good friend and co-host, Howie Dewey. How are you, dude? Yes, sir. Pretty good. Pretty good. How's it going out in the West Coast? Uh, a lot. You know, what's so interesting is they keep uh, telling us we're on lockdown, yet everybody's uh, homeless. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> I mean, yeah, where are they supposed of, to lock down to? You got a lot of super spreader events on the sidewalks out there. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. The homeless, uh, Corona, it just is a very elitist. It doesn't like to fuck with the homeless. And by the way, dog. I was yeah. just driving here and I went by, there's this one area where the homeless are that I got to go to, to get to my studio. And dude, one of these homeless guys, God bless him. He looks like he has a cabana at the hard rock in Vegas, dude. It's the exact same set. I'm like, this dude is poolside somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them have nice setups. Some of them have nice, some of them figured out like the ones here in the, in the West village. They'll find a good spot near a church under a tree and like build, basically build like a nice little setup. It's not well, too bad. Um, how a little bit about how the show came to fruition. What is this show? Real quick, uh, this is a comedy podcast that is going to delve into the world of finance. Um, and that's so notice I did not say financial advice show because we're two comics from upstate New York who've had crippling drug and alcohol problems and uh you know so anytime you're looking to get into investing okay you have to do your due diligence you have you are investing uh at your own risk okay so uh anything we talk about from here to the next couple of years we do the show you have to do your own investigation uh, my opinion is, uh, I, listen, I love Howie. Howie and I have been friends for a long time. And basically where the show came from was that, uh, Howie and I have been talking about a little Bitcoin and stuff like that. And he kind of got into, he started to talk about IRAs and I didn't know anything about it. And I was like, you know what, dude, that's what we got to talk about. Right. So Howie, first of all, for those who may not know you, cause I, I have a couple podcasts that people might know me from, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself? All right. Yeah. I, uh, I'm a guy that basically, uh, I went to college in your town of Cortland. I went Cortland to the fine, State red uh, dragons dog. Yeah. Yeah. It was either Harvard, Princeton. I ended up in Cortland. Um, so, uh, I went to that fine town and, uh, and hung out there for many years. Uh, got a degree, ended up coaching hoops for a while, went down South. Uh, and that's when I got into the financial business. Um, down there after coaching and teaching for a while, I worked for a, uh, a large Wall Street firm. Uh, I don't like to say the name of it, I could get sued, but uh, if you said the, the words backwards, it sounds like a shortstop for the St. Louis Cardinal, Stanley Morgan. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I basically worked for that crew for, for about seven, uh, actually six, seven years. And, uh, you know, it's a deal where I worked back then and, and, and basically what you would do is you'd go into interview and your job was to gather just millions of dollars in assets. And they'd say, you know, what is your background? And I said, well, uh, I have a really nice elementary teaching degree from Cortland state. Um, Okay, that's fine. Take the series seven, take the six. You pass, baby. You're on board. So what they, are they, those what tests? I mean, what are those tests? Yeah, uh, basically it's the same test that you take today. You, you, the first most important test you take, it's called the series seven. Um, it's a test, uh, 250 questions. Uh, they give you six hours to take it. Usually you can finish it in a couple hours, two, three hours. Uh, you take the test, you hit a little button. And it tells you right there, if you get a 70 or above, you're hired. If you get a 69, you're fired. And, and that's how it works. That's how, that's the real McCoy, man. So uh, yeah, you take it, you get hired. 
They send you to, I was at the World Trade Center for four weeks. Uh, they give you a nice four week crash test and how economics in the world works. And then you go back to your office and you're just, your job is to bring in assets, man. You're an asset collector. Um, and that's what I did. Then you take all the other little tests. What, what year was six. this around that you were doing that? Early 90s. Early 90s. So oh, no, 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 not, not, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Late 90s, late 90s, early 2000s. Okay. But obviously, yeah. uh, like towards the yeah. late 90s, you were there. Uh, was it still like Wolf of Wall Street type? It was running gun, everyone's up oh, below. Man, I mean, <laughs> it was, that's when it was. I mean, I got into the business because my, my brother literally. He worked for the Wolf of Wall Street, one of those uh, chop houses, chop shops. And he went in, took all the tests. Uh, and he's like, how? I don't know what, you, what you're doing teaching, but these guys I work with, they're making like 100 grand a month. You know, come to find out they were basically robbing people. Uh, but I looked at that. Uh, all those chop shops were starting to get busted in the late 90s, early 2000s. They, they were getting busted, shut down. Like boiler rooms, so I went right? With, for those who yeah, saw that, that movie, Boiler were. Rooms. It, it, it was the Boiler Room. Yeah, my brother was literally at a computer making a trade when the FBI came in. Um, so that, that shit was happening everywhere. Yeah. And that's what they would do, man. They would bust it Monday through Friday. They were on their phones. There'd be like lines of blow on, the, uh, on their desks in front of them. There were no rules, no laws, no no. It was the Wild West. And these these were twenty. Have you ever done stand up on blow? Blow? Have you ever done stand up on blow? I I don't know no, how. No, I can't say I have. No, I yeah, no. It, it's the yeah. worst. You just grind your teeth. But man, I could understand like how like being on blow and trying to like do business deals couldn't go better. <laughs> couldn't go better. I mean, like no. you're just no. gotta be selling shit. You're like, dude, this guy's really excited about this this idea they got. Man, it's like. He, you know, he's telling me beta videos are gonna kill VCRs. He's on to it, dude. Yeah. If you don't invest in Blockbuster Buster in the next five minutes, you're gonna miss out. The shit's going to two thousand probably by tomorrow. I mean, that was it. It was it was all about three words. It was called sense of urgency. They would push it down your throat. It's all about make sure you create a sense of urgency so that that dentist will write a check for fifty G right there, right now, right now. That's what it was. It was not. That is such a crazy idea to me. And, you know, yeah. I want to get more into you, but you know, the reason I, I want to do the show is because, you know, it's like, I got to, uh, everybody knows I'm known for having 90 podcasts, <clears throat> but each one of them are very specific to either something I'm very passionate about sports, uh, conspiracy comedy, or something very much I want to learn about, which is spirituality sure. and now the Cash Daddy podcast and um, Cash Daddies. Uh, it's because I don't know anything about it, man. I mean, and I'm almost yeah. embarrassed because of my age. I, I should know more about the markets, but I don't because I was living for so long, like check to check, trying to make it in comedy because I cut the cord <laughs> when I was about... 34 years old, I stopped working day jobs. And I'm like, I'm just going to somehow pay the bills. And I don't necessarily say that's the best idea to do, but that worked for me really well. I quit my uh, day job and I just started hustling, hustling, hustling. And, uh, you know, the girl I was dating at the time, you know, whenever I have financial um, things I got to deal with, I do something called send in the Jew, right? And, uh, and Dana goes in there and just wreck shop. And so she came up with, she would always be like, Hey dude, like we got to get ads here. She, she would put ads on anything if she thought she could get like 500 bucks. And, but, and that's how we survived for a very long time. It was like turn and burn, turn and burn, turn and burn, turn and burn. Yeah. And uh, up until like the comedy store started roaring in the, you know, the late teen, the late teens. And uh, yeah. So I never really got into that. And then, you know, through tinfoil hat, I started getting into like crypto and it was like kind of by accident, you know, I would have like, um, you know, uh, some of the, my guests would come on and they would be like, Hey man, you gotta get crypto. And I'd be like, oh, okay. And I, 
and bought a little crypto. But then I had a, 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 a sponsor going, hey, dude, <clears throat> do you mind if we pay you in crypto? Yeah, I'm like, that's a big yeah, thing. Why not, man? I'll try. I'll try it. Right. So it was bet the aside and they wanted to pay me in Bitcoin. And I was making a little scratch. Right. Uh, I I'd, I'd bought some things to Mac, Max Kelser, who had come on and convinced me to buy some some uh, crypto. So I bought a little crypto before this. And then they go, hey, man, we'll pay you in crypto. So I went to the other guys in the show. I'm like, do you want to get paid in crypto or cash? You're like cash. So I kept the crypto and paid them all out in cash. And here we are today. So I would, you know, and, and Howie's one of my very good friends. Like I said, we talk all the time. And I was just kind of picking his brain about his thoughts on crypto. And I didn't even know, be honest with you, Howie, I didn't even know you were in finances before. I just thought you were like running and gunning in New York, making cash on comedy. Yeah. I didn't know that you were like really deep into uh, investing and stuff like that. Oh yeah, yeah. I uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to go through a couple really hardcore bear markets, where you know if if you've been investing the last ten years, you could throw a dart. I don't care. Just about anything you hit has gone up. I mean, if you invested in Bitcoin uh, December twenty fifth, you've gone up what sixty percent? Something ridiculous. So any kind of technology, anything's gone up in ten years. But I had a chance. I was uh, two thousand one, two thousand two. 2008 uh, I went through a couple of times where the market literally bam went down 50 60 percent and that's is that's that bull or bear what is bull what is that's bear? a bear <laughs> that's a bear man when uh you know your average bear market nine months to a year they usually don't last long but when they hit they hit hard and and what it does is it creates panic and all those people that were your best friend that loved you went out to dinner with you they got millions of dollars invested with you. They all of a sudden want you thrown in the river uh, because they're they're shitting their pants. Having a, why'd you put me in this shit? You know, you told me that you told me this stuff was gonna go up forever. No, I didn't. All I told you was I had an elementary education degree. I don't know why this company hired me. I can't help you, but that's which what is, it was. That's what it was all about. Which is my theory on why Madoff is in jail because Madoff oh, ripped Christ. off. Poor, rich people he ripped off the rich yeah. the very elite and you don't do yep. that but here's the thing about Madoff is they all knew something was up they had to have known something was up because they were making money when everybody else was stumbling and they didn't care because of, like the checks kept coming in the checks kept coming in the checks kept coming in and it's just like well, that goes back to the that goes back to that mentality Number one, uh, he had he had such a following. He had so many people down in Florida, and everybody jumped on board. The guy had a good reputation of making money, and when people made money in shitty markets, they would they would tell these people, "Yeah, but the reason we're making money is because we're geniuses and we're betting that the market's going down." A lot of these people were like, "No, he's making money for me because he's shorting the markets." when everybody else is losing money. So they all thought he had this genius. The guy was a genius. The guy was a fucking crook. The guy was literally just taking cash, uh, depositing checks. I mean, his kids, everybody around him, his circle, they all knew what was going on. But I mean, hey, those old ladies down in Boca Raton that uh, had 1.2 million with him, I don't think they had a clue. I don't think they had a clue. Do you, uh, whatever you did with your computer, your sound just got way better, by the way. So whatever it is, Keep it going. Um, okay. And by the way, got better. I'm not yeah, it got better. Just know, people, I that the, the show's out. audio it will will only get better. Uh, that I don't, I can't speak for Howie, but I'm a tech tard. So outside of just recording on uh, Zoom or whatever, I'm not very good at this stuff. But as the show grows, uh, we we will get a better presentation. I promise you. So this is just the early stages, man. This is like when Apple was trading at a penny, man. Get in now, dude. Get in now. Yeah. And here's the thing about Netflix Madoff. Two dollars. Yeah, we're selling at two bucks. Yeah. Buy yeah. now. Madoff, like everybody around him's been off too. Like his son got offed, or like you know, rest in peace, committed suicide. His yeah. His um. 
accountant was found at the bottom of his pool. You know, like dude. no, that, that was a that was a bad situation. I mean, uh, that guy just. I mean, you want to talk about the definition of a sociopath? He fucked people, good friends, just bent them over and banged them. Not for a year, not for five, for like twenty years. Just didn't give a shit. I mean, when I lost money for people, it was the same investments I was in. I was losing too, man. We were all jumping off a cliff together. We're all free falling together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the way it was, man. Oh God, some so, stressful days. I watch a lot of those, um, you know, American Greed and all those shows. And like Great there was show. one guy that was ripping off his own parents, man. That to me is ca- crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, doing uh, it. that's uh, there's got to be something wrong with you. That's like the lowest possible thing that you could even a friend. I mean, that's just the lowest thing that you can do. But but when someone like Bernie Madoff, right? Does he know eventually he'll get caught? Like eventually, and just is just running it and hoping that maybe he could beat it and retire and then get out. Or is it just well, like I'm just gonna cash checks until it's over and then hide all my money? I think that goes back to the old, the old, the, the original philosophy behind a Ponzi scheme. As long as you're bringing in new money, you can pay the old. You can, you can, one, you know, like one hand washes the other. I think that's the whole philosophy behind that Ponzi. And I think he was like, look, as long as I got good salespeople, I can, I can just continue this for two, three, four, five years. As long as you got fresh money coming in, you can run those things for a while. But that, that shit caught up with him. Catches and, up with everybody. You can't run Ponzi schemes, don't work. And it's very interesting because, you know, like the stock market's been around for so long, right? Yeah. And you always get these young guys coming in and they always think they can find it like a glitch in the matrix. But, <laughs> and then they get just, they get got, man. They get got. And it's get, always something different. It's, yeah, you they, know, in the 90s, it was, it was tech stocks. In the early 2000s, it was the internet. The internet stocks, these stocks were going from five dollars to five hundred, made no sense. You got some stuff today that's interesting. You got the Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin's going through the roof. Everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. If you ask me to explain Bitcoin, I, I couldn't. It's Dude, that is your current. goal. That is your goal. That is it's your a- mopey dick. Is to figure out <laughs> how the fuck Bitcoin works. I talked to a broker today, Morgan Stanley, and I said, explain it. And he said, Howard, it's a, it's a digital currency backed by no one. I said, that's what you're going to tell me? That's your, your fucking definition? A, a, a digital currency? He goes, yeah, it's not backed by anybody. Um, that's all I can tell you. He goes, I just made some decent money on it. Yeah, it's so interesting because we can be like, Okay, because, you know, Tim Fall Hyatt, that's a different conspiracy. I mean, different podcasts, but like, okay, because what people will shout at me all the time, why are you pushing this new world order money? I go, it's interesting because it's like anybody can mine it. If they just get the right equipment and work really hard, they can mine Bitcoin. Don't you love that word, mine? <laughs> like, what are you... What do, we, do we got to go deep into the mountains in Africa? How far do we got to dig the mine? going to China? They're they're mining most of this. I love the word mine because I can't even wrap my head around that shit. I, I can't. really can't. So I called you up. When did I hit you up? And go, hey, dude, you looking at Bitcoin? I don't. It had to be like December, like what, eighteenth, nineteenth? No, it was. It, it was around Christmas and. It was trading, when you called me, it was trading at around 26 to 27. And you know, I, I called my buddy, he said, yeah, I think you could drop back down to 21, 22. So I sat there and watched it. It went to 29. Then he sent me a text. I'm looking at it at one in the morning and I didn't realize the shit trades 24 seven. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. You know, you know, the market, 
the markets where you are, they open at 7 a.m., they close at 3. Here, they open at 9, 9 o'clock or uh, 9.30, and they close at 4. Bitcoin? You can look at Bitcoin at midnight on a Sunday, and that shit's going like this. That is so crazy. I didn't know that the markets open up later in New York. See, this is why I'm here. So it opens up at 9.30 in New York and 7 o'clock or 7.37 in California? Yeah, well, well, wait a second. 9.30 here, so it's open up there. Actually, 6.30. My bad. Damn, dude. I didn't know yeah, that. I, I do remember that because I remember when we went through the training in New York, which was the headquarters, uh, I remember they had all these brokers from San Francisco, San Diego, L.A., and I used to ask him like, yo, you guys got to get up at like five in the morning to get your asses to the office because traffic out there sucks. Yeah, for and sure. And they were like, yeah, yeah, man, but that market, that market's, we're done at like three. <laughs> That's true, so, dude. And it, but I'll tell you what was crazy too. I remember where we were, markets open at 930. They close at four, th- four o'clock. But our, our manager would be like, you know what, guys? You got three, four hours. You can cold call California and Arizona. Because out there, it's only two, three, four, five o'clock. And that's what we would do sometimes. Well, okay. Explain cold calling to me. So when you go to work for one of these large brokerages, um, and they still do it, but it's not as big today because, you know, we got that do not call list. Back in the 2000s, everybody, but there's still, I still get calls. All the time, um, dude. It's, yeah, I feel so bad for these people, like these guys trying to like get you to like vote for something. You're like, and you're like, okay, okay, today I'm going to assume this is just going to be a regular person, unlisted. Hi, how are you? And when nobody instantly answers, I'm like, oh, fuck, dude. Hi, I'm calling for re- Representative Johnson. Can we get you? Hang up. Um, don't need anything now, to do with you. If I get a call from a weird number and I pick it up and somebody right off the bat goes, hey, is this Howard? I'll talk to him for a second. I'll be like, you know what? I'll give you a shot. You got 30 seconds. Yes, it is. How are you doing? How are you doing today, buddy? Hey, listen. And I'm like, here it comes. And I'll rate it. I'll rate it a little bit. I'll rate the call. But the ones like you say with that 10 second, there's nothing. That's those are the India calls. Hold on. Oh yeah, for sure, dude. Those we are the India call. calls. Those are the yeah, Indian those, calls. That's what the Indian calls, man. You know, it's like, hello, Howard. How are you? Uh, uh, how are you feeling? You have health insurance? I am calling you from San Diego. It is so sunny, and I might have to talk it to you. I might go get some tasty waves and hit on some white women. That, that's 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 it you get some crazy you know and it's usually like health insurance or college loans which i, I you know it's like what are you kidding me i haven't gone to college in decades um but, uh, have you ever seen that video howie of uh the guy who uh hacked in to the cameras at an indian call center no oh it's the best dude they, we played on one of my podcasts called broken simulation and dude this guy can see them why he's talking to them. Oh, <laughs> no. it's the best dude. And he's like, Oh, I live here. in Can I live here in California? And he's like, where? Oh, I live in San Jose. He's like, no, you don't. Oh, I do too. What are you talking about? He's like, what's your favorite restaurant? And you see the guy starting to Google San Jose restaurants. It's like, don't Google. It's like, I'm not Googling. What are you talking about? I would never do that. And it's so good, dude. It's hey, who's so- that? Hey, you'd be like, who's that lady sitting right behind you, right yeah. behind you, Bobby? Why is that guy have a weird shirt on? What are you doing? Are you watching us? You scumbag. You scumbag. That is wild. But no, we used to cold call, call California. And we'd call like every now and then you'd call and you'd get a dentist in like LA. And you'd be like, hey, Gino, how are you? It's Howie here in uh, Morgan Stanley in New York. How are you doing? Why are you calling me from New York? Why? Because I'm on Wall Street. I get information faster than anybody in the world. That's why. You want to talk to your broker out in LA or do you want to talk to a guy that knows what's going on right now? 
Bobby, I'm going to go down to the happy. I'm going to go down a happy hour in about five minutes. And I'm going to hear more inside information than you've ever heard in your life. You really call. For, and that's what we would do. We would call and like, just try to like, just ring in one or two after hours. You know, that's almost what say, strippers do with trying to convince you you're going to get laid. Right. Like when you're at the a, same thing. you know, a strip bar, which is kind of like, I want to get it real quick. Cause I want you to continue the story, but you know, a big part of the show is Howie. We were talking when we were coming up with the idea. By the way, I called uh, Howie. Go, hey, dude, this is a show you should do. And I realized, oh, I want to be on that show. So I called him up. I go, I I'm your co-host. And he goes, oh, okay. I, I guess I, I, I guess you're on the show. And uh, <laughs> but it's like we were talking about this, and I mentioned on a couple of my other shows about how how like I want this show to be for the inner blue collar people, people check the check. And really for these, uh, you know, internet rich people. And I'm talking like Patreon, YouTube, only fans, right? I mean, like you got chicks out there, like, like finger blasting and buying houses. And you know, it's like, yeah. cause I used to, when I, he's like, I don't know what you did after you graduated college, Howie, but I, I fucking, I, uh, I, uh, I went and worked in a strip bar. That was kind of my gift to myself. And, oh yeah. Okay. And like these ch chicks went home with thousand dollars. This is early. This is early. This is mid nineties going home with a thousand, fifteen hundred, eight hundred dollars gone within a week because their boyfriend spent it on garbage. So I was like, dude, if you if you really are an OnlyFans and I have zero problems with it, take some of that bat in your ass money and like s learn to invest it. Have you're yeah. working hard, learn your you have your business uh, have your money work hard for you. Yeah, you take you take a 25, 30 year old girl making ah uh, making 80, 100 grand a year, if she just invests a couple hundred a month into a tax deferred IRA into the market, that's going to grow seven to 10% over the next 30, 40 years. By the time that girl's 55, 60 years old, she's going to have half a million, 700, 800, even more there. That's taxed. That comes out tax free if she's got that in a Roth IRA. So, you know, it's, it's a safeguard. When you're 55, 60 years old and you got that much, you got seven, eight hundred thousand dollars, which can come out tax free. You know, the world crashes, the economy crashes, the market crashes, whatever. Hey, guess what? You can you, you don't have to stress. You can breathe a little bit. You can put that money away in your 20s and 30s. I, I, dude, I think it's I, I always want to become a, a financial advisor to the strippers. I mean, if you can go to a strip bar, cold call them like you're doing, dude, with these guys, these dentists. Imagine if you did that with yeah. strippers with like disposable cash like that. Take some of that main stage money, lady, and put it in an IRA. If so, that's, that's a good point. If somebody ever sat down with a couple of them, I mean, if they're not too methed out and they can like stay on task for a few minutes and just do a couple simple things, they're, they're set. They're good to go. Let me tell you, when I was a financial advisor, and I'm not making this up, the most, the, the, mo the, the, the most not intelligent people in the world, the people that had a very difficult time wrapping their head around investments were doctors and lawyers. Doctors and lawyers were the worst. Most of them have been married, divorced, they're paying alimony, they're buying expensive cars, boats, pissing their money away. The guys that I had that were millionaires and they had money invested in four or five different places. They were plumbers, electricians, small business owners, uh, guys that ran painting companies. Those guys had millions. They could buy out the doctors and lawyers 10 times over. I'm not making that up. That's, that's a true story. Because those guys live within their means. They were putting $1,000 away every single week or whatever into tax deferred places and the money was just growing. I mean, and that's the whole thing about like women and who they want to date. They all want to do date doctors and lawyers. It's like, dude, plumbers, dude, I don't care what's going on in the economy. 
Plumbers are cash and checks, dog. You know, I I had a plumber. One of the guys that I had is a, I'm not making this is a true story. This guy was in Savannah, Georgia, and he was a plumber. And I called him, and he was on. I had a high net worth list that I called. These people all had at least half a million up. Called the guy, met him for coffee. I, I said, "How long have you owned your plumbing company?" He said, ah, "Like 15 years." And I said, well, I'd like to sit down with you and go over your statements. So we sat down. He pulls out a stack of papers like this. And he starts, he's got 50,000 here, 85,000 here, half a million here, 700,000 in an annuity here. And I'm like, how did you gather all this? He said, you know, I just put a little away every year. I got five trucks. He said, you know, I, I try to put as much money away tax deferred as I can. I just put it into these mutual funds within the annuities or the IRA. He had a SEP IRA for his business. This guy was like 45 years old. He was worth a solid two and a half million. That doesn't even count the five apartments that he had that he was renting out. I mean, this is a plumber. Yeah, that is my next thing. It's like how to invest in um, real estate and all that stuff. Cause there's some crazy tax laws coming in in California. Like if you own a house, you sell it because you want to leave the state, they could tax you on that. That to me is insanity, but you got to know this stuff when you get into it, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that they still have the first time buyer situation where I think, I mean, I, I, this, again, anything I say on here, if you're listening, always check with your accountant. You know, that's the most important thing. Check with your accountant, tell them what I told you. And they'll tell you yay or nay. But pretty much a first time buyer, if you sell the house, you don't have to pay capital gains taxes on it. What that means is if I buy a house for $150,000 and I sell it 10 years later for 400, okay, I don't have to pay all the, ta the taxes on those gains that I made for the first house that you buy. I think every other house after that, you have to pay taxes on it. Damn. Capital gain taxes. Damn. They just got taxed Again. on everything now. Again, the capital gains tax. That's something we'll get into later. But that's kind of what I got talking to you about this whole show in the first place, because you got talking about Bitcoin. And I'm like, OK, that's and I have I have comedians I talk to and they're like, yeah, I'm trading this stock. I'm like, that's great. Do you have an IRA? No, I don't have an IRA. Well, yeah. you know, every time that you, every time you trade a stock, or let's say you buy Bitcoin at 25 and you sell the Bitcoin at 40, you got to pay capital gains. I don't care who you are. You have to pay capital gains taxes on every single penny that you made from what you put in. Whereas if yeah. you buy that investment vehicle within an IRA, you don't have to pay any taxes on it. Dude, see, when you brought up IRA, I didn't even know anything about it. And that's why I think this show is really important. It's like, I want it. I want us to be able to, you know, give away, you know, get out some important information that's digestible so that people can go do their own research and find out what's right for them. Yeah. And I think it's very important, man, because, you know, I I'm going to be honest with you, man. We take a look at like middle class, lower class. Most of them don't know anything about stocks. Nothing. No, most I'd and most people in the most people don't even even upper class most people don't a lot look how many guys how many athletes or actors whoever runs into money how many times you've heard about them losing everything within 5 years because they put someone else in charge they gave someone else fiduciary responsibility they never checked shit and then 5 years later there's nothing left i mean I remember explaining IRA to a, to a comedian. He's like, man, you, you really invest in the Irish Republican army. They're still around. <laughs> that, that says it all, man, right there. Individual <laughs> retirement account, not Irish Republican <laughs> army. They're two different things. Yes. They are, but nobody realized. And you know, it's like, I think I was, who was I talking to? Uh, I talked to someone about this show and universally everybody was like, dude, that's a great idea. And they were talking about how like school doesn't teach us any of this. We go to school, you nobody know. teaches it. You go to college, maybe, but outside of that, you got a major in that. Why aren't why aren't high schools teaching finance? 
it really, it, you know, it goes it, back to the old adage in high school, you could take a course, remember they, they teach you how to balance a checkbook or uh, you know, how to pay a bill, or, but they never really taught you. And I think a lot of it was, it's tough finding people to teach that stuff, you know, in a, in a school where you're making what, $40,000 a year. <laughs> it's, it's, it's tough I'm finding you, those dude. people. I'm with you, dude. Yeah. It's like kind of shocking how much teachers make. Like you do, there's teachers on OnlyFans and they're losing their jobs. They're like, I don't give a shit. I'm making more money. Yeah, exactly. It's amazing. Whoever came up with that in the last nine months, it's amazing. I would say the number of people that I know that have started OnlyFans pages, it's like, it's right up there with the amount of people I know they had COVID. It's like a, it's like a, it's a, it's, it's a direct analogy. It's about well, the same. Know, I know so many. And dude, and you need to tell me to shut up if I cut you off too much, dude. I realize I've cut you off twice. I'm like, fuck, man, bad habits. Oh, no, man, no. But it's like, and then there's something called many fans, and that's even more filthy. It's just, it's just, it, there's a race to filth. I was talking to my friend the other day about Tara Patrick, right? And I got to write that down. Okay, many fan, many vids. Write it down. Trust me. Yeah. It's great. But it's like, uh, Tara Patrick, like, she did the Naughty Show way back in the day. Like, back when, like, like out, podcasting was truly outlaw, man. It was really outlaw. It was especially driven by white comics, white male comics who couldn't get on TV. So they need a way to get fans. So we started just running gunning red band and myself. And we, and we did the naughty show because I had the live show. I'd pitch it to comedy central and uh, comedy central said, we love the show. We hate Sam. And, and so that's the story of my life. With comedy central. That's comedy central, man. Comedy yeah, central. Yeah. Now we can just all go and fuck that dead corpse. They call comedy central. But the point is dude, is that I wanted to I wanted to promote the naughty show because back when the naughty show started, there was no like there was there was like a special night like once a month at a comedy club for dirty comedy, right? Because like as much as I respect and I love Jerry Seinfeld because I feel like he is himself that's him on stage, like he's that guy, yeah. right? Uh I think he did a, a, a like he's like a Michael Jordan type, like. Michael Jordan really did some damage to the NBA because it went from those great teams of the Showtime Cel uh, Lakers and the Boston Celtics to like one-on-one -on -one buy my sneakers brand. And yeah. I feel like that's what happened with uh, Seinfeld. Like, you know, we had Dice, we had Sam Kennison and all this great stuff. Comedy's going, and then here comes Jerry Seinfeld and he gets this show Seinfeld with Larry David. And now all of a sudden, you know, everybody wants clean observational. And I think it hurt the art for a while because we're not all married with kids, you know, and want to do that. Some of us want to talk about Coke and eat butt, you know, because that's what we know. That's what we know. And knowing is half. No, you're right. So you know, the funniest that. thing, that, that, that guy out, that guy at the comedy store had literally had me crying. And I watched his bit for maybe 30 seconds. That guy, Brian Holtzman, that did that little bit on Seinfeld. I, I literally fell off the couch. I was crying. That was like, that was hilarious. No, he is. He's a, like, Jerry. <laughs> he, oh, dude, at the end. Uh, when they had they had him on the comedy source, but oh, I should not you introduce you as from the comedy source uh, doc on Showtime, because you guys might know <laughs> Howie from that from the, from that doc, dude. You can see him on there. He was he was in one of, like probably one of the greatest pictures taken at the comedy store uh, with hey. all the murderers that were there that day. Yeah, it was that. That was uh, that was a, that was just a that was a great night. I was just in the right place, right time, right crowd. It was a great night, and I was sitting on my couch one night, and the phone rang, and someone I can't remember who it was. They were like, "Yo, you gotta watch this uh, this Showtime documentary. It's called The Comedy Store." I'm like, "I'll watch it." He goes, "No, man, you gotta watch it, man. There's a picture of you on there." <laughs> I was like, "Really?" Yeah, most of the yeah. black and white pictures were from my comedy store, my comedy uh, chaos show. Absolutely.
which uh, helped yeah, change a, my life and just it became it an amazing show man amazing show it was great so something i did earlier in the show and i want to apologize to everybody i cut you off while you were doing your pitch and because it reminded me of all the who i want this show to resonate with which is the internet rich people but you because you were talking about calling up a dentist like what was your can you do your pitch one more time like because it was so good dude it was a great i had about i had about 10 different pitches man and like yeah i would do the dentist pitch i'd be i'd call a guy in la i said look i know you're busy you got patients but look real quickly i just want a chance to earn your business uh, you know, I'm, I work from I work for a big company right here in Wall Street. I probably get information a little quicker than the guys out in L.A. do, if you know what I mean. You know, uh, how about we do this? How about I start you with, you know, 2,500 shares of this. It's down. It's a good buy right now. We've got a really low P.E. I'd like to get you on board. You know, and you'd hear a guy and he'd say, nah, you know, I can't. I, I, I got to go home and, and check with the wife. And I'd be like, yeah, let me ask you a question. Like. When the wife's out buying eggs, do you call her and ask her which kind? You know, do you tell her like, <laughs> you know, you want jumbo eggs or regular or, you know, what kind is it? Be I, no, you know, you let her do your stuff. You got to do your stuff. This is your, and this is what you, you would just constantly be giving rebuttals to every single thing that they would say. And then you, as long as you kept them on the phone, they would, they would ask you about a stock that they own, you know, or another investment they had that, you know, uh, a lot of times I, I would I would look up guys that had a lot of money and I would look up their bio on the Internet, you know, like, wow, this is Joe Johnson. He has he's had season tickets to University of Michigan football. He has a box seat at Michigan for football games. Oh, look, he paid twenty thousand dollars for that box uh, five years ago. I'd call him up, and get him on the phone. Be like, Look, Joe, the only reason I'm calling you is because I'm a huge Michigan Wolverines fan. Um, and I would talk for 15 minutes about, you know, Michigan basketball, Michigan football, um, Notre Dame, Michigan games, you know, and next thing you know, I'd go over to Hilton head, have a beer with him. Talk. I went over one time and hung out with a guy for four hours and talked football. He probably drank 12 Miller lights. And he said, look, my wife's coming home. I, I got to, you got to go. And I'm like, all right. And he went in the back room, came out with a checkbook, wrote me a check for 250,000 and said, just put it in the account. We'll figure out what to do with it tomorrow. Oh like, my yeah, yeah. God. Yeah. yeah. That used to happen a lot, you know, but it, you know, it was hard. It was all about gathering assets. And there was, you know, 5,000 guys like me doing the same thing. Um, I was good at gathering assets. One thing I probably wasn't as strong as is maybe not losing their money because I had an education degree. I didn't know what that, I was just listening to our analysts and there half of those guys were a little crooked. So, you know, the market's tanking, they're telling you to buy more. So, so, so what is the best day you've ever had? And then what was the worst day you ever had? Oh, best day I ever had was we were this was the late 90s and I was young I didn't know what the fuck I was doing but the guys around me were all buying these things called options calls risky investments where basically you buy the stock on a Tuesday and if it jumps up a lot in the next couple days you make 20 times what you would make just buying the stock if it doesn't jump up, there's a little thing called time value. You lose a lot quickly. And I remember I bought this company. It might've been Boston Scientific. I'm trying to think. It was trading at like 15, 16 bucks a share. And I got out of playing in Savannah. I think I bought like $5,000 worth of it. I got off the plane in Albany and my phone started ringing and it was the guys in the office and they're like, Howie, this company just got bought out that something happened with the company and the company went from $15 to about 85 in 30 minutes. This is back in the days where stuff was just, and they were like, yo, your options, those 5,000, you're up to like 80, 85,000 right now. And I'm like, get out of it, get out of it, get it. So yeah, within the course of like five hours on a $5,000 investment on these short-term calls, 
made like 75 G. Damn. And, and let me tell you, that sounds great. That's like monopoly money because three months later, this is March 16th, I think of 2000. Cause I'll never forget it, it was St. Patrick's day. And I was with my wife at the time downtown and I'm taking money out I'm buying drinks for everybody. I'm the man. And finally, she's like, what are you doing? You're like, you're spending too much money. And I turned to her and I said, I'm going to retire in a year. This is in my like late twenties. <laughs> and I'm going to be honest with you over the next three months, mm -hmm. every penny I think I ever made, I lost that times 20 after that <laughs> I, every day when the market started tanking, did you pull your money then, from that one yeah well no i, I pulled a little <laughs> bit i pulled a little bit but no like once you get I'm 80 you, you're dude. like you want to make 200 you. 400 you, my goal is like i want to get 1.5 mil like all these other guys are saying they're making everybody ended up broke because look what happened was the market started crashing and it would hit a new low, and our ass would say, that's it, that's the bottom, start buying. So we'd buy. We'd buy, buy. July and August went by. We're losing more money. It hits another low. And then there was a little thing called September 11th. Oh and let me tell you something. God. We're all in the stocks. And when that hit, you couldn't pull your money out that Tuesday because the market shut down. They put in all these stops because when that market opened back up, I want to say it might've been Friday. It was a couple days. When it opened back up, you saw your net worth on your screen go from whatever to about nothing. It was done. It was over. Uh, Jesus. Yeah. And you know, that's kind of what I'm going through with Bitcoin right now because it is exploding. And I believe it could get what, I mean, not just a little bit bigger, astronomically bigger not not i mean there are some people the guy who basically created the dark web silk road he says it could get up to 300 million dollars of bitcoin because cash is everywhere just crashing you know but there's some estimate 300 thousand that there's there are financial experts saying the value of a bitcoin right now should be four hundred thousand dollars equivalent to co to to gold right and well, yeah we don't know what it is and that's why conspiracy theorists is like dude this is the cia they're fucking with you maybe <laughs> maybe but it's like well, here's the thing I will tell you this. It's trading at what? Like 39.40 right now. Let me look. Keep going. It, I would think it's going to drop back just because that's what everything does. It, it goes up. You know, you go up 20%, you drop 15. You go up another 20, you drop 60. I think it's going to keep going up. The reason I do think it's probably solid is because, you know, I read the article by JP Morgan. You know, that's a very large investment bank. And they, th I think they had it at 130,000, 140,000. And that's conservative. So you got major investment banks, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan. And I think those guys have pretty high estimates on it for long term. So yeah, you're probably good there. It's gonna be crazy. I wish I had bought it at 27. Dude, you, I told you uh, when the epidemic or the epidemic just hit. And by the way, just to let you know, for you guys who follow me on, on Tim Fall Hat, I appreciate you checking out this podcast. It's going to, I can already tell it's going to be classic. It's a, it's already a fun conversation between me and a good friend, but just so you know that Howie has lost more people than anyone I've ever met in my life to I mean, like he is the one guy where like, he's fucking up the median. Like he's lost. And I, I know it's like, I'm trying to sound funny, but and it is super sad, but this guy's lost a lot of people. So when he, featured for me in St. Louis. I go, Hey dude, super happy to be working with you. Please leave death in New York city. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what I do. The, the best news I ha I've had is like I said, I've, I've known quite a few people. How many people have you lost? Howie who died. Of COVID. I know personally about nine, nine, dude, yeah. nine per like yeah. personally. No, not like I know yeah. somebody who knows somebody nine. That's no, nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, uh, it's almost like every two months 
when somebody gets it and they go and, and they're intub incubated, uh, you're on some pins and needles. And it just brings flashbacks about the last person. My, my roommate in college got it four weeks ago. Uh, we got news two weeks ago that the, the COVID just ruined his lungs. In other words, he had fibrosis in his lungs. He was, they gave him like a 10% chance. Got news yesterday that they stabilized him. They're sending him to Florida for a lung trans. He's got to get a lung transplant, a, a whole new fresh set of lungs. Oh my but God. He's the first guy that I've known that uh, has been ventilated that has lived. He, he's actually, it looks like he could Dude, bounce the back. The number so is, it's almost 90%. And yeah, 90%. Well, here's an investment. Uh, uh, topic for an investment show. Uh, how much money are hospitals making on this fucking thing? It's like, I mean, hey, I do. Like I said, I had to go to the walk-in uh, emergency room recently because something was wrong with my tongue. And I, you, dude, when you make your money talking and then there's something wrong with your tongue, you're like, okay, that's it. Like 2020 is just fisting me right now, right? I was like, it's just deep, heavy, big. Joe Rogan fist, right? You ever see that guy's bear fist? That's what 2020 was doing to me at that moment. I'm like, I'm getting fisted by a bear, okay? And I just want, I so it ended up being nothing. But I'm watching uh, just because they're running COVID tests and they're just one after another. After, I mean, like, dude, cash register, cash register. And like, you know, I've had guests on, to, on my other show talking about how like, Dude, they're getting like 50 grand for like ventilators. They're getting yeah. paid 50 grand for a ventilator. And you know, hospitals are, that's one entity where uh, we'll talk about that at some point in the future. But you know, you have two types of investments. You have equities, which are stocks, uh, mutual funds, ETFs, things like that. But then you have debt instruments. We'll talk about like bonds. And those are hospitals. Hospitals, uh, states will issue bonds which are a real, usually a safer, safer investment for hospitals. Um, because let me tell you, hospitals over the long term, they usually don't do so well, you know, with the insurance problem in this country and people not paying bills. And a lot of hospitals go bankrupt. So I don't know, maybe this ventilator, ventilator thing will help them out a little bit. Yeah, I think that, that that's it. So, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna come wrapping it up here on our first episode. I'm very happy with the show. Uh, I'm happy where it's going, you know, and uh, what we can do with it, man. I mean, there's so much we can talk about here. So much. Yeah. And so many guests, we want to have guests on, you know, listen, I want to have authors who write books. I want to have some of Howie's friends. I want to have OnlyFans or like OnlyFans who are like, I'm trying to invest my money. What do I do? And be like, hey, we'll have a conversation. Obviously, again, you have to invest at your own risk. Nothing's guaranteed because I guarantee the ones that will, will always give you money, probably give you a penny a year or something like that. That's the game we play. That's the That's right. game that it is. Uh, Howie, do you have, how's your other podcast going? Bad fast. Bad fast. Uh, I got, I got to edit a couple things. I I've, I've interviewed one person. Uh, I got to edit a couple things. I got a kid from Ithaca college, man. Uh, my man, Evan hands helped me. He's got me rolling this cause I need his technology skills. Um, but that thing's going to be rolling probably in the next couple days. So that's it. And like, listen, guys, maybe once this thing gets a little traction, so it's cooking with, cooking with gas, we'll answer your questions and you can say, and we'll hit, you know, you can ask Howie anything, what he thinks. And uh, we'll go from there, dude, and just have a good time and uh, have fun with this and shed a little light on stuff. Cause you know, for me, man, I would love to sit down and study all this stuff. But the truth is I have a monkey in my head that plays the symbols and uh, it doesn't want to sit down and read any books. So I'd rather have a conversation with somebody about how it all works. Uh, I'm more interested in gold and silver and like assets like that. And maybe IRA, I just like, I'm, I don't know how much of the stock market I want to get into, but I still want to know how it works, how it goes and all that stuff. And I'm just really interested. And so, 
So gold uh, and silver, man. You you can buy gold and silver and put it in your IRA. You can do that. That's what I want to do. So maybe that'll be the next episode. We'll break down IRA and get into that. And then we'll do some interviews with people about what's going on. But you know, uh, this is the first episode. It has been a great time. Howie, you got anything you want to say? Any final thoughts? No, man, I think it's going to be great. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm about a 10 minute walk from wall street. So, uh, I, I look forward to going down there and seeing some old buddies. Uh, and, and, you know, it's all changed, man. Like there's, there's really no more trading floor. Like there used to be, there's no more big commodity. Everything's done online. Um, it changes like every six months. It's all algorithms now. Uh, and I, but I still got friends in the trenches. So I think we'll have a lot of fun people on here. You know, it's interesting how we is like, when we bring up Bitcoin, they're like, what happens if the internet goes down? I go, well, how are you going to get your stocks? How are you going to get your money out of the bank? Everything's tied to the internet. So your Bitcoin is no different than your money you got in your bank. Try to get your money out when the computers are down. Everything's computerized. So if, no. if, if the, and that's, that's another thing is cyber wars. They talk about that, but we'll get into that, man, all that stuff. And it's like, you know, here's the whole thing. The language on here is going to be truck stop worthy. Okay. Because you guys, and you guys can go listen to a, a whole bunch of financial shows where they talk super dry. That's not this point of this show. This is like real talk, real comics, talking finance, and uh, that's the show. And I know it won't be for everybody, but it will be perfect for those who like it. And uh, so I'm Sam Tripoli. Howie, thank you so much. Howie Dewey, thank you so much for doing the first episode of Cash Daddies. And we will talk to you soon. Take care, everybody. Take care, Howie. Take care. I'm out. Take care.